Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we study our last topic during this series, we ask, as we have before, that you will be present in our midst. Give me a clear mind, humble heart, and give all of those who are watching this presentation the willingness to follow your will. We thank you for the privilege of prayer that we can approach the throne of the King of the universe. We know that you have heard this prayer and you will answer because we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, this is the last presentation in the series on Matthew chapter 24. This is actually presentation number 24. And we want to begin by reading Matthew 25 and verses 1 to 13. It's the famous parable of the ten virgins. Now as I read this parable, I would ask you to try and place yourself in the environment where this parable took place. It's not only a parable, parable. Jesus actually told the parable when he was observing the details before his very eyes. There was a wedding about to take place. So I'm going to begin at Matthew 25 and verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now the coming of the bridegroom in this parable is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. We studied this in our previous presentation on wedding customs in the times of Christ. The context makes it absolutely clear that the bridegroom comes to the wedding chamber for the wedding and that this wedding takes place in heaven where Jesus will receive from his father the kingdom and Jesus will marry his bride, which represents the totality of faithful believers. We must link the parable of the ten virgins with the previous context at the end of Matthew chapter 24 and verses 36 to 44. So let's read those verses now, which is the context that appears immediately before the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And now comes an example of this idea that the wedding takes place in heaven, and then afterwards Jesus will come to take his bride to heaven. It says in verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, notice, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until, this is the first until, 
until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know, that is those who were outside, did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's a coming here, which is at the closing of the door, and there's a coming when actually Jesus comes and the wicked are destroyed and the righteous are spared inside the ark. We find in verse 40 the following words, Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, at the mill. one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now this is not the coming at the second coming. This is the coming of Jesus to the Father to marry His kingdom, to marry His bride when the door of probation closes. Verse 43, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So it compares the coming of Jesus for the wedding with the coming of a thief. Now, as I've mentioned before, the coming of the thief has two specific points of time. One is when the thief actually comes, everybody's sleeping and doesn't know that the thief has come. And then the people wake up in the morning and they realize that the thief has come, but it's too late. When Jesus comes to take His kingdom, when Jesus comes to marry His bride, which is the totality of His faithful people, people will be oblivious that the wedding has taken place in heaven, that the door of mercy has closed. People will not know that the door has closed until Jesus comes to receive His saints, to take them to the heavenly reception, and the wicked are destroyed. So the previous context indicates that this coming is not the second coming of Jesus to the earth, but the coming of Jesus to His Father for the marriage to His kingdom. This is why these verses compare the coming of Jesus to the coming of a thief. So you have a comparison between the days of Noah and the parable of the ten virgins and the close of probation. So let's draw a few parallels between the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man to the Father to receive the kingdom and then the ensuing destruction afterwards. So here are the parallels. If we remember the closing of the door of the ark and the destruction of the wicked and the saving, of course, of God's people during the flood were two related but separate events. In a similar way, the closing of the door of probation for the world is related to the second coming of Christ, but they are two separate events. The door closes and then after that comes the second coming of Christ to the earth. Second, the preaching of Noah under the power of the Holy Spirit, inviting people to gather into the ark to be saved, is represented by the uh, five, by the ten uh, virgins lighting the way to the bridal chamber, which symbolizes the preaching of the gospel under the power of the Holy Spirit, inviting people to come as guests to the wedding. Number three, the midnight cry represents Noah's last call at the door of the ark for people to come into the ark. The midnight cry in the parable of the ten virgins represents the final call to the living to accept the invitation into the wedding chamber. Number four, the closing of the door of the ark represents the close of probation. The closing of the door in the parable of the ten virgins represents the closing of the door of probation for the world. Five, when the door of the ark closed, 
The kingdom of the faithful was complete. Noah and his family, the saved, were inside, whereas the wicked were outside. In other words, Noah's preaching divided the world into two groups, those who were saved and those who were lost, those who were inside the ark and those who were outside the ark. Likewise, when the door of probation closes for the world, the righteous will be inside the wedding chamber, whereas the wicked will be outside the wedding chamber. Next, number six, the time of trouble for Noah and his family in the ark, which lasted seven days, represents the time of trouble that God's people will go through during the time of Jacob's trouble, before the second coming of Christ and after the close of probation. And finally, the return of Jesus from the wedding to take his subjects to the wedding reception in heaven is represented in Matthew 24 by the angels coming and receiving the elect, catching up the elect into the clouds to take them to heaven for the reception. So you'll notice that there's a parallel between what happened in the days of Noah and the parable of the ten virgins. And the coming of the groom to marry his bride represents the coming of Jesus to his Father in heaven to receive the kingdom, to receive his bride, to be married to his bride, the totality of his faithful people, after which the door of probation closes, the tribulation comes, and then Jesus comes for the second time, takes his bride to heaven for a thousand years, and then brings his bride back to the earth for the permanent home in a new heavens and a new earth. Now let's take a look at the symbols of the parable. We have ten virgins. They represent those who professed to have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. All of them accepted the gospel invitation to be guests to the wedding. The lamps represent the scriptures. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. The oil that they have in their lamps represents the Holy Spirit, according to Zechariah chapter 4. The lighting of the way to the wedding chamber with the lamps that have the oil represent the preaching of the gospel in a dark world, inviting sinners to come to the wedding chamber and be inside for the wedding. The wise virgins represent the genuine followers of Jesus. The foolish virgins represent superficial followers of Jesus. They had oil in their lamps, but they did not have an extra supply of oil in their vessels. They are represented in the parable of the sower by the stony ground hearers. The stony ground hearers started well. The plant sprouted and began to grow. However, when the sun rose, which represents tribulation and persecution, the plant dried up, which means that these are fair-weather Christians. When everything goes well, they follow Jesus. But when a delay comes and trial comes, they fall away. The bridegroom in the parable represents Jesus, and the bride represents the totality of the believers in Jesus Christ. What does the extra supply of oil in the vessels represent? Well, those who have accepted Jesus as Savior receive the early rain. But if you do not persevere in the Lord, you will not receive the latter rain. In other words, the five foolish virgins started well, but the delay in the coming of the groom for the wedding discouraged them. They allowed the early rain experience to die, and the latter rain could not benefit them. When the plant dies, it's no avail for the latter rain to fall on the plant. The delay in the parable represents the coming of Jesus to the wedding in heaven, which delayed longer than expected. The slumbering 
represents the length of time that passes where God's people are expecting the groom to come to the wedding, but he delays in his coming to the wedding. The midnight cry is the clarion call for the beginning of the judgment first of the dead in 1844, and then the judgment of the living shortly before probation closes. The request for oil on the part of the foolish virgins from the wise represents the fact that character cannot be shared. The character that is formed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the oil, cannot be shared with others. They must develop their own. The coming of the bridegroom represents Jesus going to His Father in the most holy place to receive the kingdom or to marry His bride. Now this happens in two stages. The first stage was in 1844. When Jesus moved to the most holy place, to begin the judgment of the dead. The second is the return of Jesus to His Father after placing the sins on the head of the scapegoat. This is very important in the court. So Jesus goes to the court, places the sins on the head of the scapegoat that have been cleansed from the sanctuary, and then He returns to the Father for the final wedding, because both the dead and the living have been judged. The sins have been placed on the head of the scapegoat in the court, and now Jesus returns to His Father for the wedding. The wedding represents the moment when Jesus receives the kingdom from His Father in heaven, when the judgment concludes. The number of His people is complete. His kingdom is complete. His bride, which is all believers, is complete. Those who were ready go into the wedding chamber for the wedding. I want to underline once again that the totality of believers is the bride or the kingdom, whereas the individual believers are the guests to the moment when Jesus marries the totality of His kingdom. The righteous going into the wedding means that even though they are physically on earth, they enter the heavenly chamber for the wedding by faith, because their records are up there. In other words, they are written in the book of life, and their deeds are written in the books. So even though they are on earth, Jesus goes in heaven and marries the totality of His people up there. And then finally, you have the shut door. The shut door represents the moment when the wedding, uh, when the wedding is about to take place, everybody's case is decided. When the five foolish virgins go to try and get oil, that is during the time of trouble when many will go from east to north and they will seek for the Word of God, but it's going to be too late. The Lord is going to say, I never knew you. Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 expresses this moment. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In other words, they're going to try and find the, the, the oil for the lamp. It's not going to be available because probation has closed. Ellen White described professed Christians in the time of trouble that are found unready. In Great Controversy, page 620, she wrote, Those professed Christians who came up to that last fearful conflict unprepared will, in their despair, confess their sins in words of burning anguish while the wicked exult over their distress. These confessions are the same character as was that of Esau or of Judas. Those who make them lament the result of transgression, but not its guilt. The voice, I do not know you, is to those who have not prepared a character fit for heaven before the close of probation. To be ready in the parable means to pray, to watch, to occupy, to invest, to work, and to reveal the love 
of Jesus. Now this parable has a threefold application. The first application is to the literal Jewish nation. The second application is to the great Advent movement of 1844. And the third application is to the period of the loud cry of the remnant just before the close of human probation. Now if we had the time, I would read a lengthy chapter from the book Early Writings where Ellen White compares the uh, messages of John the Baptist, Jesus, and Peter with the Advent movement of 1844. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that, but I would encourage those who are watching this presentation to go to the book Early Writings, pages 259 to 261, where Ellen White draws a parallel between the message of John the Baptist, the message of Jesus, and the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost, and the first, second, and third angel's messages that were given between the year 1840 and 1844. It will be an enriching experience for you to read that particular chapter, Early Writings 259 to 261. But then let's talk about the fulfillment of this parable with the Millerites in the 1840s. I want to read a statement that we find in Great Controversy 393. By the way, I would suggest that you read the entire chapter. I'm only sharing certain details. Great Controversy 391 through 408. Ellen White wrote on page 393, chapter 25 opens with the words, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Then she writes, Here is brought to view the church living in the last days, the same that is pointed out in the close of chapter 24. In this parable, experience, their experience is illustrated by the incidents of an Eastern marriage. So the word then that begins chapter 25 connects with chapter 24. So we need to read the last verses of chapter 24 to understand the connection with chapter 25. We have the going forth of the virgins. In, in the 1840s, this represents the Reformation under the proclamation of the first angel's message, announcing that the hour of God's judgment had come. That's preaching on Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy 393 and 394, the coming of Christ, as announced by the first angel's message, was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. So the coming of the bridegroom is an announcement of the first angel's message that the bridegroom is going to come for the wedding, and he's going to begin the judgment of the dead, then afterward the judgment of the living, and then his kingdom will be complete and he will marry it. So the going forth of the virgins represents the reformation under the proclamation of the first angel's message, the announcement that the hour of God's judgment had come. Now all who joined this Millerite movement claimed to follow the Bible and to have the Holy Spirit. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy 394, All had taken their lamps, the Bible, and by its light had gone forth to meet the bridegroom, the bridegroom. Now the error that they committed was that they believed that the coming of the bridegroom was that Jesus was going to come to the earth, he was going to destroy the earth with fire, and he was going to take his bride to heaven. They misunderstood the event. They thought that the coming of the bridegroom was the second coming of Jesus. All of them claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ. We also notice that the wise virgins had a profound experience with the Lord and longed for the coming of Jesus. Ellen White wrote about this group of believers in the 1840s, Great Controversy 394, the following words, The latter class had received the grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, which renders His Word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. In the fear of God, they had studied the scriptures to learn the truth, 
and had earnestly sought for purity of heart and life. These had a personal experience of faith in God and in His Word, which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay. In other words, they had a genuine connection with Jesus Christ, that is, the wise virgins. What about the foolish virgins? What about the foolish Millerites, if you please? Well, they had a superficial, emotional, impulsive, fearful relationship with the Lord. In Great Controversy, page 394, Ellen White wrote, They had moved from impulse. Their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren. In other words, their brethren were all excited, so they got excited too. She continues, Once again, their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace in the heart. These had gone forth to meet the Lord, full of hope in the prospect of immediate reward, but they were not prepared for delay and disappointment. In other words, when the delay and the disappointment came, they lost their faith because they were not deeply rooted in their relationship with Jesus Christ. So then there was a tarrying time, or a delay. What does that represent? It represents the fact that the Millerites believed that Jesus was going to come to pick up His bride in the spring of 1844. However, Jesus, of course, did not come to earth as they expected in the spring of 1844. In fact, He did not even go to the Father for the wedding in heaven in the spring of 1844, because the Day of Atonement was in the fall. And so they had not taken into account that the decree of Artaxerxes was given in 457 in the fall, therefore the end of the 2300 days had to be also in the fall. So they were wrong about the season of the year. During this tarrying time, the superficial and the impulsive Millerites fell by the wayside. In Great Controversy 394, Ellen White wrote, By the tarrying of the bridegroom is, representing the, is represented the passing of the time when the Lord was expected, the disappointment, and the seeming delay. Both groups slumbered, but one group gave up their faith and the other group did not. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 394, They all slumbered and slept. One class in unconcern and abandonment of their faith. That is the foolish virgins. And then she says, The other class patiently waiting till clearer light should be given. In another statement, we find in Great Controversy, 395, in this time of uncertainty, the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver, and their efforts to relax. But those whose faith was based on a personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath their feet, which the waves of disappointment could not wash away. On page 395, Ellen White also wrote, At this time, the superficial could not lean upon the faith of their brethren. Each must stand for himself. Ellen White also wrote that during this period, between the spring of 1844 and the fall of 1844, fanaticism arose among the waiting ones. In Great Controversy 395, she says that many of those who had embraced uh, the idea that Jesus was going to come in the spring of 1844, they then turned against those who were slumbering but who had not lost their faith. She wrote on Great Controversy 395 about these enemies of God's people. They feared it might be true, that is, the coming of Jesus, yet hoped it was not. And this was the secret of their warfare against Adventists and their faith. On the same page, Ellen White wrote, About this time, fanaticism began to appear. Some who had professed to be zealous believers in the message rejected the Word of God as the one infallible guide, and claiming to be led by the Spirit, 
gave themselves up to the control of their own feelings, impressions, and imaginations. But in the summer of 1844, a man by the name of Samuel Snow, this is known as the Seventh Month Movement, discovered the mistake that they had made. No, Jesus was not going to come in the spring of 1844. He was going to come in the fall of 1844 on the Day of Atonement that is mentioned in Leviticus 23, which fell October 22, 1844, in that particular year. And so now there was a great revival. Let me read Great Controversy 398 where Ellen White described this discovery. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end and the autumn of the same year to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. In other words, the preachers used this expression in 1844, in the summer, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And so the slumbering at that time woke up, and there was a great religious revival. They had kind of been uh, in suspended animation, if you please, dear, after the first disappointment. They hadn't lost their faith, but they, they were looking for additional light. So now there's this great revival. The printing presses rolled again, and there was powerful prophetic preaching that instructed the people that the bridegroom was going to come back to the earth to pick up his bride on October 22, 1844. Ellen White wrote about this revival in Great Controversy, page 400. Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land, from city to city, from village to village, and into remote country places it went, until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. aroused. In other words, now they wake up. Fanaticism disappeared. This is from, from the summer, from the time that the loud cry is being given, or the midnight cry is being given. Fanaticism disappeared before this proclamation, like the early frost before the rising sun. Believers saw their doubt and perplexity removed, and hope and courage animated their hearts. There was little ecstatic joy, but rather deep searching of heart, confession of sin, and forsaking of the world. A preparation to meet the Lord was the burden of agonizing spirits. Uh, spirits. There was persevering prayer and an unreserved consecration to God. Ellen White described this revival. By the way, folks, Ellen White was an eyewitness to all of this. So she's just not writing as a historian who's writing several years later about the experience that some people went through. She went through this experience. What she's describing was her experience. In another place, Great Controversy 401, Ellen White wrote, Of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. Even now, after the lapse of many years, all who shared in that movement and who have stood firm upon the platform of truth still feel the holy influence of that blessed work and bear witness that it was of God. The people during this period received an abundant portion of the Holy Spirit. Those who had lost their faith, who had a superficial knowledge, they did not have the extra supply of oil. They did not have that intimate relationship with Jesus. It was a superficial relationship. But those who had a relationship with Christ after the first disappointment in the spring of 1844, they did not lose that connection with Jesus. We find in Great Controversy 402 and 403 these words, Like showers of rain upon the thirsty earth, the Spirit of grace descended upon the earnest seekers. Those who expected soon to stand face to face with their Redeemer felt a solemn joy that was unutterable. The softening, subduing power of the Holy Spirit melted the heart as His blessing was bestowed in rich, rich measure upon the faithful, believing ones. On page 403 she wrote, Every morning they felt that it was their first duty to secure the evidence of their acceptance with God. Their hearts were closely united, and they prayed much with and for one another. They often met together in secluded places to commune with God. And the voice of intercession ascended to heaven from the fields and groves. 
the assurance of the Savior's approval was more necessary to them than their daily food. And if a cloud darkened their minds, they did not rest until it was swept away. As they felt the witness of pardoning grace, they longed to behold Him whom their souls loved. But Jesus, instead of coming to the earth to marry His bride here and take her to heaven, Jesus actually moved from the holy to the most holy place to begin the process of examining the garments to determine who are subjects of His kingdom, who belongs to the bride, in other words. In Great Controversy, page 427, Ellen White wrote, They that were ready went in with Him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They were not to be present in person at the marriage, for it takes place in heaven, while they are upon the earth. The followers of Christ are to, now she quotes uh, Luke 12, 36, the followers of Christ are to wait for their Lord when He will return from the wedding. However, they are to understand His work and to follow Him by faith as He goes in before God. It is in this sense that they are said to go in to the marriage. Was there a shut door in 1844? Yes, there was. The door shut for those who were superficial and did not follow Jesus into the most holy place. You see, those individuals who had been superficial when uh, the faithful Millerites said, well, Jesus went into the most holy place to examine the garments to then after the process is finished to marry his bride or to take over the kingdom. They said, ah, oh, that's just a faith saving invention on your part. They lost faith. The superficial did not follow Jesus into the most holy place. They remained in the holy place. And Ellen White describes vividly how they received a counterfeit gift of the Holy Spirit breathed on them by Satan and they were left in total darkness. You can read early writings, page 54 to 56. Ellen White wrote in Selected Messages, volume 1, page 63, I was shown in vision and I still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light, were left in darkness. And those who accepted it, and received the Holy Spirit, which attended the proclamation of the message from heaven, and who afterward renounced their faith, and pronounced their experience a delusion, thereby rejected the Spirit of God, and it no longer pleaded with them. So the superficial class, represented by the foolish virgins, and those who... Uh, did not accept the messages from the get-go, these individuals, uh, their door of probation was closed. When Jesus shut the door in 1844, those who rejected the first two messages found themselves in total darkness. Most of the Christian world, however, kept worshiping in the holy place, thinking that Jesus was there, oblivious that Jesus had entered the most holy place to establish who will be a subject of his kingdom. And Satan then took control of those who rejected the messages. Once Jesus, the king, has examined every case and has determined who is a subject of his kingdom, after the time of trouble, Jesus will come to pick up his members of his kingdom or his bride. Now, when Jesus comes to get his bride, he will take his bride to heaven. And there, the reception, the wedding reception will take place. The wedding uh, reception includes the bride, which is the totality of God's people, whereas the individuals at the wedding represent the individual persons who were followers of Jesus Christ. So Jesus will take his people to heaven, the wedding reception will take place there, and then God's people will be in heaven for a thousand years. I like to think that this is the honeymoon. And then Jesus will bring his bride back to the earth, the new Jerusalem, with all of the redeemed in it. And this will be the permanent home of the bride with the groom. This place where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now this parable also has an application to events immediately before the second coming, not only to 1844. 
Let me read you a passage where Ellen White describes the parable of the ten virgins vividly. This is found in the book Christ's Object Lessons 405 and 406. Lingering near the bride's house are ten young women, robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil. All are anxiously watching for the appearance of the bridegroom. However, there is a delay. Hour after hour passes. The watchers become weary and fall asleep. At midnight, the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleepers, suddenly awaking, spring to their feet. They see the profession moving on, bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The ten maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth. However, five have neglected to fill their flasks with oil. They did not anticipate so long a delay, and they have not prepared for the emergency. In distress they appeal to the wiser companion, saying, Give us your oil, for our lamps are going out. However, the waiting five, with their freshly trimmed lamps, have emptied their flagons. They have no oil to spare. And they answer, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the procession moved on and left them behind. The five with lighted lamps joined the throng and entered the house with the bridal train, and the door was shut. When the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, they received an unexpected denial. The master of the feast declared, I know you not. They were left standing without, in the empty street, in the blackness of the night. As Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, He told His disciples the story of the ten virgins, and now notice, by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before the second coming. So this parable not only applies to the Millerite movement, it also applies to those who will be alive when the door of probation closes. Now let's take a look at the end time fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. First of all, the virgins. Who are the virgins? Christ's Object Lessons, page 406, Ellen White wrote, the two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. Incidentally, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, when he wrote to the Corinthians these words, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the virgins are those who profess to have a pure and true faith. Now, both groups of virgins had many characteristics in common. They all went out. They all had lamps. They all had oil in their lamps. They all slumbered when there was a delay. All claimed to be waiting for the bridegroom. What do the lamps represent? The lamps represent the Word of God. You have Psalm 119, 105, where it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Ellen White in Christ's Object Lessons, page 406, wrote, By the lamps is represented the Word of God. What does it mean to light the way to the wedding chamber? It simply means preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, because the oil represents the Holy Spirit. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 406, Ellen White wrote, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So basically, the lamp with the oil that gives light represents God's people enlightening the way to the wedding chamber and encouraging people to come and go into the wedding chamber. In Matthew 5 and verse 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
And we read previously Luke 12, 35 and 36, where Jesus says to his followers, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. See, this connects with the parable of the ten virgins. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. So God's people don't actually physically go to the wedding, they wait for the master to return from the wedding, and it ends by saying that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Now what does the extra oil represent? That is the primary distinction between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. What is represented by the extra oil in the flagons? The wise had extra oil in their flagon, and when the bridegroom delayed, well, the oil in their lamps began to be scarce, but when they woke up, they had extra oil that they could put in their lamps. The wise virgins, as we noticed, had a deep relationship with Christ, a relationship that could not be broken by delay or disappointment. The extra oil represents that they had formed a character that was in close connection with Jesus Christ. On the other hand, the foolish virgins, as we've noticed, were superficial Christians. They were like the stony ground hearers that started growing well, but then there was a foundation of stone and the roots could not go beyond a certain direction. And when the sun came out, the plant that had started to grow died. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 408, in the parable of the ten virgins, in the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For, oil. for a time there was seen no difference between them. Now comes the comparison. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming. All have a knowledge of the scriptures. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect His appearing. However, as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried. And when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. They have perhaps received the early rain at conversion, but they have not received the latter rain which will allow them to go through the time of trouble. So what does the delay represent? Well, people expected Jesus to come to the wedding long before He has. They expect him to, expected Him to come in His second coming long before He has come. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, we find these words, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But there is going to be a midnight cry. What is the midnight cry at the end of time? Revelation chapter 18 explains it. It's called the loud cry of the fourth angel. This angel is going to announce not that Jesus is coming to the most holy place to judge those who died, but Jesus is now coming into the chamber to judge those who are alive at the very end of time. This is the judgment of the living. Now I want you to notice uh, what Ellen White has to say about the coming of the midnight cry at midnight. She says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 414 and 415, the great apostasy will develop into darkness, deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it would be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. You see, when Babylon is filled with every evil spirit, according to Revelation chapter 18, there will be a loud cry saying, Come out of Babylon, my people. Multitudes will come out of the apostate churches and join God's remnant. And when all decisions have, made, have been made, either for the Lord or to stay where people are, 
then the door will close and Jesus will marry his kingdom because all of the subjects of his kingdom have been made up. What is meant by the refusal to share the oil on the part of the wise virgins? Ellen White wrote in the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 412, No man can receive the Spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. And then she quotes Ezekiel 14, verse 20, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, that is in the land, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. In Christ's Object Lessons 4.12, Ellen White wrote, So now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So the shut door at the end of time comes when Christ's kingdom is complete. He's judged those who died in the Lord. He's judged those who are alive right before the close of probation. People have made their decisions to be on the Lord's side or on Satan's side, and then the door will close. In Great Controversy, page 428, Ellen White wrote, when the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then and not till then, probation will close and the door of mercy will be shut. Thus, in the one short sentence, they, were with, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut, we are carried down through the Savior's final ministration to the time when the great work for man's salvation shall be completed. You remember that the foolish virgins had a superficial relationship with the Lord. At the very end, this is a very important point now, at the very end of His most holy place ministry, after Jesus has cleansed the most holy place, the holy place, and the court of the sanctuary. You can read this in Leviticus 16. Jesus will place the sins of all of his faithful followers on the head of the scapegoat in the court. And then he will return to his Father in the most holy place, change his garments, and put on his garments of a king. He will take off his high priestly garments because his intercession is finished, and we'll put on his kingly garments, because he is now going to come as King of kings and Lord of lords to rescue his bride from the earth. It's obvious that Jesus could not come to the Father for the final judgment of the living if he is already with the Father. So Jesus goes from the most holy place where he studied the cases of the, we, the righteous dead, and then... He takes all of the sins of those who died in the Lord, of those who are alive when the door of probation closes, takes all of those sins, places them on the head of the scapegoat, and then He comes to the Father for the final wedding. How terrible are the words for the superficial virgins? I know you not. In early writings, page 281, we find these words of Ellen White. Those who had not prized God's word were hurrying to and fro, wandering from sea to sea and from north to the east to seek the word of the Lord. Said the angel, they shall not find it. There is a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. What would they not give for one word of approval from God? But no. They must hunger and thirst on. Day after day have, have they slighted salvation. In Great Controversy 6.20, a statement that I already read, those professed Christians who come up to that last fearful conflict unprepared will in their despair 
confess their sins in words of burning anguish. They'll say, let us in, Lord. But the answer will be, I know you not. So those professed Christians who come up to that last fearful conflict unprepared will in their despair confess their sins in words of burning anguish while the wicked exult over their distress. distress. These confessions are of the same character as was that of Esau or of Judas. Those who make them lament the result of transgression but not its guilt. And so then Jesus at the end of the tribulation will come to rescue His bride from the death decree, and then he will take them to heaven for the great celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that will be in person. So you notice that the wedding takes place in heaven while God's people are on earth. Jesus takes over the kingdom, he marries his bride, the totality of his people. The individuals who have been found faithful, they are the guests to the wedding, but they're on earth. They go to the wedding by faith. But then, after the wedding takes place, and after, at the very end of the time of trouble, Jesus will come to empirically pick up His bride, to take her to the New Jerusalem, and the New Jerusalem will be filled with the guests, or the corporate totality, with the bride. And then will take place the reception. What a reception it will be. All of the redeemed together, the bride all together, the individuals at the table, the guests, to this glorious wedding supper of the Lamb. And God's people will sit at that table, which Ellen White says is many miles in length, but their eyes will be able to embrace all of it. There will be wonderful fruit there. And here is the amazing thing. Jesus is actually going to gird himself and he is going to be the waiter. God's people will be sitting at the table and Jesus will wait on them. Jesus will actually serve them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the great heroes of history will be there at the table. Every person who has ever joined Christ's kingdom, who has ever become part of Christ's bride will be there. And so then the wedding supper will take place. A thousand years will go back by and at the end of the thousand years, the new Jerusalem with all of the inhabitants of the city, all of Christ's kingdom, His bride, will be brought back to the earth. And the new Jerusalem will settle upon the Mount of Olives that has been split by the feet of Jesus. And Jesus will create a new heavens and a new earth, which will be His eternal home of Jesus with His bride. What a day that will be. Don't miss it for anything.